All right, we'll go ahead and get started now then. Um, my name is Laura Saba. I am an associate professor at University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. I am also co-director of the NIDA Center of Omics Systems Genetics and the Dictum that we're gonna, that has brought this uh, webinar series to you. The general housekeeping rules of our webinar series are, um, is please keep yourself on mute during the presentation. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat. And um, Rob and Shaunak are watching that chat and they'll interrupt and ask for clarity questions. But we've also um, set it up to have an additional 30 minutes after the presentation to be able to get more in depth into a discussion about the topic and answer some of those, those more thoughtful questions, get opinions from the audience and things like that. Um, we just mentioned briefly as people were logging on, this is the last webinar for the month. Next month in November, Shanak and Gregory will be presenting um, an intro to Julia. And then the last meeting in December will be a group from Jax that will be presenting on some of those web resources. So we've got a few more lined up. We're always appreciate hearing, hearing back from you guys if there's certain topics that you want us to cover. But as usual, we're recording this. It'll be available online along with the um, lecture slides. There are a few references and things like in this presentation that I think are helpful. And so we'll make those available after the webinar. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I think I'll go ahead and jump right in. So the title to the webinar today is Guide to Evaluating the Application of Machine Learning Methods in Genetics Literature. And so what we're really doing today is talking a lot about terminology and thinking about the data sets and the outputs from machine learning. So we aren't going to be digging into what's the right type of machine learning model to use for my data or how to implement it, but we're instead doing more of a broad overview. And so the rationale for machine learning and genetic studies, hopefully um, most of this is obvious. We've got lots and lots of molecular phenotypes that we can now be measuring. We're not just talking about a few genetic markers. We're talking about uh, the whole transcriptome, proteins, metabolites, all of these molecular entities that we wanna know how they associate with disease and with other phenotypes that we're looking at. And so not only do we have a bunch of potential predictors for our model, but each one of these predictors, we know that our diseases are rarely, rarely caused by one single gene, that most often it's genes working together, not just even side by side, but interacting with each other to produce these complex traits. And then we also know that genes have lots of roles in the, in, um, Genes and proteins have lots of roles in the cell. And so which particular role is important for this particular disease or phenotype is important. And finally, all the interactions that we're barely starting to, to scratch the surface of, the gene by gene interactions, the gene by environment interactions. And really the, the point of this slide and bringing this up is just to give you a sense of the enormity of the data and why we need advanced analytical tools to help us really make sense of what's going on. So the rationale for this particular webinar, so why do this introduction, is that uh, machine learning methods are becoming much more popular, especially as people are being able to do multi-omics research and grabbing not just one single type of molecule, but being able to look at, at a lot of different things and learning how to put this information together. And really that you need to have that strong root in machine learning or understanding the basics to be able to read an article and, and decide on your for yourself whether or not that the methods that they've used, the data sets that they've used are reproducible and rigorous and, and worthy of taking on to the next level of research or thinking about for clinical practice. So we're gonna start off by just going through some of the basic terminology. So some of the things that I feel like gets, gets mixed up often and, and certain fields like certain terms like artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus deep learning, how do those all relate to one another? Um, and then we'll talk about some different types of machine learning and, and how they're 
situations where they're appropriate. And then we're gonna dig into methods for comparing the performance of those machine learning um, models. So one of the slides that I like to start with is this is statistical modeling is this concept of how do we get from predictors to outcome and thinking about even if machine learning is an appropriate tool for what we're thinking about. So in general, there's two types of approaches that we take often with our data sets and within our research that depends on which approach we take depends on what our research question is or what's important to us in, in this pursuit. And so if we think about prediction versus information, so in prediction, what we're doing is taking these X elements, so any predictors or potential causals, causes and looking to predict the outcomes. And we're not as concerned about accurately modeling the in-between nature part of it. We're more concerned about accuracy and precision when it comes to making a prediction of that outcome. So there's lots of different situations where that's obviously of use and it's okay to have that black box in between, right? And then there's other situations where we're more interested in the information. So what's of interest in this pathway from X to Y isn't necessarily our precision at, at estimating Y, but more about can we understand what happens to take X to Y in this case. And in general, machine learning or prediction analysis are more geared towards that prediction question. They're more geared towards how accurately can we predict an outcome based on our input values. And so we're not, um, how or why a factor influences the outcome is often not directly modeled. And you'll notice that I'm hedging quite a bit here and saying often and most of the time, because as learning machine learning methods mature, a lot of them are becoming more interpretable and are blurring that line between what I'm trying to distinguish here as machine learning and network analysis. So I am talking in general generalities here a bit, but realize that as, as we learn more, as we under develop better machine learning models, we'll hopefully um, not make it such a stark contrast. We find things that can do accurate prediction and mimic the biology that we already know to give us both insight to not only what someone's predicted outcome is, but why they are predicted to have that outcome. And so a lot of times to distinguish these two for machine learning, we'll talk about those being ideal for biomarkers of disease, for drug response. When we're talking about about it in a pharmaceutical sciences context. When we talk about it in genomics, sometimes we're talking about um, predicting the end of a transcript or predicting a transcript start site or, or a piecible splice junction, right? We don't, we don't necessarily need to understand the mechanism of why this DNA sequence um, signals a polyadenylation site. We're just more interested in where that polyadenylation site is. Whereas when we move to that network analysis, we get a more general understanding of why these predictors are associated with this outcome and how. And so the way I've always learned the distinction between these terms is artificial intelligence really falls under that big umbrella of programs that have with the ability to learn and reason like humans. So, and so artificial intelligence could even include programs that we explicitly program to tell the computer that two plus two is four. Those would fall under um, artificial intelligence because we're getting a machine to do the work that the human um, had, can do or taught the machine to do. Where we take a subset of artificial intelligence is when we're talking about machine learning. And so that's algorithms with the ability to learn without explicitly being programmed. And so no longer telling the computer necessarily that two plus two equals four, but giving it examples of addition problems that equal four so that it can learn how to solve that problem. And then finally, deep learning, which has become a hot topic here in, the, in 
um, recent times, but it's really a subset or a specific type of machine learning where they're using artificial neural networks to adapt and to learn from vast amounts of data. So it's it in itself is a machine learning problem, but it's a special kind of machine learning. And one of the things that that we do want to emphasize that too is that that machines can forecast, they can memorize, they can reproduce and choose best items, but they can only are as good as what the programmer and what the data are that are going into it. And it's it's a little glib to say they they can't call kill all humans, but there are a lot of ethical um, considerations when talking about machine learning and when talking about the data that's going into the machine learning and how the outputs are being interpreted and how they're being applied that can have some real um, dramatic ethical consequences. So we need, do need to, to remember that the ethical part of applying these models and what by removing some of the two plus two, how we're letting the, the machine learn it and what biases we're adding to it. And so just a quick terminology. And so again, throughout this webinar, we're going to talk a lot a bit about um, linking terms to that you may be more familiar with to terms that are used in the machine learning literature. And so going back to this X predicting Y scenario in machine learning, a lot of most people use features instead of predictors or input variables. And when we're talking about supervised learning, which we'll define here in a minute, that why or that outcome um, or that dependent variable, if you're more statistically oriented, we're now calling a label. So we're labeling it as having disease or no disease or belonging to class A or belonging to class B. So, so you'll notice a lot of these things I've pulled off the internet. There's a lot of really great resources for explaining machine learning and some of the bigger concepts and even some of the smaller concepts about the individual methodologies for machine learning. So I've included websites anytime I've pulled a, a figure off that so that you have some kind of reference to go to. So this one, the main types of machine learning. Um, classical machine learning means that we have relatively simple data. These are some of the methods that you've been hearing about for tens of years. And in classical machine learning, we have what we consider clear features. So we know we want to put height and weight into our model. We, want, we know that a feature should be the GC content of that region or this canonical splice site that we know of. Um, reinforcement learning is where we kind of learn on the fly. So we don't have data, but we have this environment to, to, to do a trial and error to really figure out. Um, ensembles is when we use a, a several different types of machine learning models and take the aggregate of the results from all of those machine learning models. And then neural networks and deep learning is much more complicated data. And when we're not really sure how to quantify our features, how to summarize the information we're getting off of an image, for instance, or we don't know if we should use the mean or this quantitative value squared or uh, how these two features interact with each other. So there's a lot more complicated data that features are, can be a little bit less clear. <laughs> and belief in a miracle is, is also a commentary from the website that I pulled this off. But again, reminding you that features throughout here, we're talking about the characteristics used to predict our outcome. And so, I'm sorry, so reaction. So we're gonna focus this first part into the classical machine learning realm, where there's two different types of methodologies. The first is what we call supervised, and the second is unsupervised. In a supervised machine learning model, we have both that feature information and the label for our set of data that we can learn the model from. So that's what makes it supervised. This is we're telling the machine exactly who does and does not have disease, what, where the splice site is and where the transcription factor binding site is, for example. And these contain a lot of the, the methods that we've seen before, like linear regression, sparse regression, um, um, random forests and things like that, that we're using to predict our outcome. Unsupervised learning, this may be something more in the context of 
trying to def to identify clusters of subjects with similar cancer related traits. So we don't have a disease, no disease, and we might not know exactly which cluster everyone should be belong into, but we wanna try to subtype our patients or subtype our DNA sequence into groups based on similarities. And there's lots of different ways to do that. We're gonna focus mostly today on that supervised classical machine learning models rather than the unsupervised. So in classic machine learning models, a couple things that I wanna point out here. Um, is on the left hand side, this is the rule based system. So this is not machine learning. That's that big umbrella artificial intelligence that would not fall into the machine learning um, sub subsection of it. So this is when we're telling the computer exactly what to do, but we're not doing it by hand. So that so we're programming what we would have to do over and over again. Classic machine learning is this next line. So instead of um, telling the computer exactly what to do. We're learning our model. So here in gray is what our, what the machine learning process is gonna do. And the white is what we present into them. So in classic machine learning, we have what we call hand designed features. So I'm telling it exactly, I'm putting in um, weight in kilograms and height in centimeters or in meters, right? And I'm designing the features and quantitating them and putting them in the format that I want to go directly into the model. So the most simplistic machine learning model that you probably all have used or read about but might not have classified in your head as machine learning is actually any kind of regression model. If you think of our, even a simple linear regression where we have one predictor and one outcome, we're building a model that's going to predict our outcome and we're using our independent or our features to do that. And so oftentimes linear and logistic regression gets immediately unwieldy when we start having a lot of features and have more features than we do observations. So the next step up from linear and logistic regression in the field of machine learning is what we refer to as sparse modeling. So you're still relying on some of these assumptions of linear relationships between your um, features and your labels, but with sparse modeling, we're able to put in a large number of possible predictors and then scale back a bit those based on some of these regularization methods. And so a lot of the ones that we'll hear that you hear often are um, lasso regularization, ridge regression, and elastic net. So lasso and ridge regression, both what they do to be able to handle this, this abundance of predictors is they have penalties to the regression model that shrink the coefficients to avoid overfitting and to allow for these multiple predictors. They take a couple of different approaches to how they shrink it. So in a lasso regression, many of those coefficients are shrunk to zero or left out of the model when we go to estimate the entire model. Whereas in rig, ridge regression, we're not eliminating them, but instead putting down uh, or shrinking their influence on the final predict prediction. And so elastic net tries to take the best of both worlds and combine those two. So this is one approach for still staying in that logistic regression or that linear regression framework, but allowing for more predictors than you do outcomes by um, limiting the influence of the coefficients on your outcome in a very general um, perspective. The other and with, with these sparse modeling, we can do both dichotomous outcomes and we can do continuous outcomes or continuous values that we're trying to predict. Um, one of the other popular methods that's considered a little less parametric than depending on those linear regression type models is um, regression trees for classification. And so what these regression trees basically do are taking a sample 
And they're examining each one of the features and saying that, can I use this feature to dichotomize my population in um, where my outcome is more prevalent in one group than it is the other? So for this classification tree here, we're trying to determine if a subject is male or female and we have height and weight. So they say, if your height is over 180 centimeters, if you answer yes to that, then you're probably likely male. If you say no to that, we're gonna follow up with a question about weight to try to classify you as male or female. And so one of the benefits of regression trees over something like a linear regression is you are starting to get into some of these um, interaction effects, right? So weight might not have been a good predictor at the first step of our decision tree, but when we've subsetted our population to the, only those that are shorter, weight can be used to distinguish males and females. The other thing that a regression tree does that a sparse linear regression or any kind of regression model um, doesn't do is also doesn't rely on that linear relationship between our predictors and our outcomes. Um, regression trees for classifications aren't very stable, just as, as is if we apply it on our data set as a whole, meaning that if we looked at different populations, or different subsets of the population, we may get very different um, regression trees. And so, sorry. So what's been used and what's popular to combat that is called random forest. So in random forest, we're building those regression trees and we're building lots of them. So that's where the term forest goes. So we subset our samples and we subset the the number of genes or the number of features that can go in our model and generate a tree. And we do it over and over. So we have lots of different trees in our forest that may be slightly different because they had a different patient set that was used and a different set of predictors. And so the idea here is that our strong predictors are gonna come up in more trees. And so we're gonna see that aggregated influence across our entire forest. And then when we go to run a prediction for an, an individual, we're gonna run their features through each one of the trees in the forest. And each one of the trees in the forest is gonna get a vote on the probability of that sample having the disease or no disease or whatever our outcome is for that particular analysis. So those are two kind of the most popular methods of machine learning that fall under that umbrella of classical machine learning. The next, the next part that we're going to talk about is this concept of deep learning. And so here you can tell that, that instead of hand designed features, we've now made our features box gray meaning that the features and how they're represented, represented in the model is determined in part by the model. So in our classic deep learning, again, this is a very, very general overview. There are people that are much more expert than me in the deep learning concepts. But in general, what we're doing is we're taking this input, we're designing or figuring out simple features that go into our model that can form layers of our model. And so let me go on one more thing. So a lot of times it's applied in image analysis. So in image analysis, you may start off with the input pixels for, for an object. And so what deep learning does is then build up in layers. So the first hidden layer that we might not, um, we might, not be able to quantitate on our own, but the machine does a much better job, is identifying all the edges that it sees in the image. And so then the, the deep learning model takes those edges and tries to put identify corners and contours from those edges. And then the corners and contours get interpreted into object parts. And then the object parts get in, interpreted into object um, identities. And so there's a lot of black box elements to deep learning and that, that 
a lot of this information is hidden from the user and not um, something that we could link biological or cl clinical significance to. And so that's our general two cent overview of machine learning. Now we wanna know how do we judge whether or not our model is performed well. We've done the fancy, um, made our features, we've done the fancy model. How do we even know if it works? And so here, the general overview on a supervised machine learning process is we're gonna, the first stop is preparing to build the model. So thinking about what exactly we wanna do grabbing the data and then preparing the data, whether that means standardization, whether that means normalization, um, but getting it ready to go into our model. And then the next step is training our model with a data set. So in this graphic, um, the different colors represent different features that they may have different levels at. And then these labels along the side are our outcomes. So if we're looking for transcription start sites, and so we're going to use this training data set to build a model, and then we're going to use a separate independent testing data set to see how well it worked. Right. And so the first step when thinking about the literature is really thinking deeply about what is the data that they were using and was it the most appropriate and how much how big is my scope of inference from that data? How much can I generalize from the data that was used to build this model to something that I may use in my individual lab that someone may use in their clinical practice? And so oftentimes we have three sets of data. So the two big umbrellas here are validation data sets and development data sets. And these two data sets should be completely independent. And then this, the underdevelopment data sets, we often need both what we call a training data set and a tuning data set. And the reason why we need a tuning data set are there some parameters in the model that we call hyperparameters. And we're using the term hyperparameter to distinguish it between the parameters that the model learns and estimates on its own by looking at the data versus hyperparameters that we as the analyst or who's applying that model has to set a priori and determine the best value for. And so digging a little bit more deeply into these two, these three types of data sets, I do want to mention that both development and hits data sets in this instance need to have measurements for your predictors or features and for your outcome or label. So these are really important data sets when thinking about how people developed their model and how they evaluated their model. So some of the, the good questions to ask or the important questions to ask is that, first of all, did the authors clearly, if you're evaluating the literature, did the authors clearly define the training and development data versus the test or validation data? So are those two completely independent data sets and they weren't using the same data set to train their model as they were to tell you how wonderful their model was? Because we need to know how generalizable is the model we built on this data set on other data sets. So that's where the independence becomes really important. And again, thinking about the data set that was used for training and development, is it similar to the types of data sets I would use this model on? So, right, is it trained on human DNA sequence information, but I'm trying to think about would it be applicable to rats and vice versa? And then also the, the, la the very last point here is to think about the potential confounders of social and sources of bias in any data set, right? So when we're training a model, when we're trying to make this model learn how to identify cases or learn how to identify these labels, it's really important that we have accurate 
labels. The one example that they've given in some of the literature that I'm going to show you at the end is um, image analysis for identifying a certain um, type of uh, precancerous elements in the eye. And so if you have three radiologists looking at the same image and they all three give you a slightly different result, how are you gonna choo choose which one to use to train your model, right? And they gave the example that if they required their um, labels or their, their diseases or cases to be, um, that the, all three radiologists was in, in agreement, they got, a very, they got a different model than if they used an outcome where at least one radiologist said that this is potentially cancerous, right? And the other thing about the data element side to really think about, so how good is the outcomes, outcome labels, how accurate are those, but also thinking about how the potential predictors were included. Did the algorithm choose which predictors to include and how they would be represented, or is that something that was presented by the um, analyst or the researchers that were learning or developing this model. And so one of the interesting things here, we talked about the distinction in the deep learning models versus some of the classical um, machine learning models that it being this, how are predictors represented? So in general, the, the classical ML models tend to be a little bit more intuitive when thinking about and explaining Whereas the deep learning models have a potential to be more accurate because they can take and flip, flip things that we think or how we think these predictors should be represented to best fit into our model. So the next part of this supervised learning uh, machine learning process is the training model. So again, taking that same figure and narrowing it down to these training and tuning data sets. So I wanna take a minute and talk about hyperparameters and tuning data sets. So not all machine learning uh, methods require hyperparameters, but your sparse regression ones, your deep learning do require some type of hyperparameter. And since there's something that we have to establish and fix ahead of time and are dictated by the analyst, it's important that we think deeply about these and, and not just pick a number out of a hat, right? Because they can affect the parameters, they can affect our models in, in, the, in the end on that final accuracy. And so one of our difficulties is really figuring out how to optimize these hyperparameters. So one of the common tools that we use, rather than having an independent um, training data set and a tuning data set, is a lot of times um, researchers will use what's called cross-validation. So in a cross-validation study, what they do is take their training data set and split it into training and tuning. They set the hyperparameters at certain values and calculate some of our prediction measures on this data set. They do that same, use the same hyperparameters, but instead take out a different section of the data and see how that gives us different results. And so what they're doing is almost kind of randomly splitting our population so that we can see how does this, these hyperparameters perform even when we're not using the same samples over and over again. And so we're tuning, what tuning means is that we're setting the hyperparameters, we're calculating those prediction measures, and then we're changing the hyperparameters and calculating the performance measure, measures. And we're doing that multiple times over multiple sets of hyperparameters. So if you have you know, more than one, you have to vary both data sets. And, and this is where it could be computationally expensive. But then we're going to use that data on performance on those different combinations of hyperparameters to choose the best hyperparameter for our data set. And so uh, we just, yes. Uh, Rob had a question, and I think some people might be wondering about, about that too, which is what is a hyperparameter? 
or what is the difference between a parameter and a hyperparameter? Yes, no, that's a great question. So hyperparameters are parameters or values that the analyst has to set before they learn the model. And so when you think about classic linear regression, right? We in classic linear regression, we simply tell tell the machine or the 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 computer that here's my outcomes and here's my predictors, and the model will use something like least squared uh, least squares to estimate the parameters in that model to estimate those linear regression coefficients, and so the analyst doesn't have to intervene in that sense. Right, because the model is figuring it out based on the data. So parameters are derived from the data. With hyperparameters, those are things that we need to set ahead of time. Um, the example that comes to mind for me, and <laughs> maybe not the greatest example, but is k means clustering. When we have to tell the algorithm how many clusters we want to see. Right. There's ways to make a good guess about how many we need by looking at the data from a different perspective. But in the end, for that particular algorithm to run, we as the analyst are, have to tell the machine how many clusters to look at. And so there's, sub, there's parameters like that in um, deep learning and sparse regression. So if you think about deep learning, one of the most obvious hyperparameters that we have to set is the number of layers to consider, right? So the example we showed, I think, had four or five layers. But at some point, you have to decide how many layers you want in your model. So a hyperparameter is something that the data doesn't automatically tell us based simply on our machine, on the machine learning methodology that we're using. Yeah, thank you. And I think Joe Nido had a related comment. He said, uh, similar to priors. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Similar to a prior. And so, I mean, the concept here is we could pick a random number and our model would run and we would get one answer, and that would be a prediction. But a lot of times we want to make sure how do we make sure we pick the right number for that hyperparameter, and that's where the tuning data comes into play. And so it's almost some pre-work or some almost an empirical prior to the data. And once we've tried out all these different hyperparameters and estimated their performance, then we can pick the best one by averaging over, in this case, our five splits. So we would want it to do best no matter which one we used for tuning and which subset we used for training. So once we have the hyperparameters that we want to use, we're going to add that back to our data and apply our machine learning model once again to get that final model that predicts probability of label based on features. So that predicts our outcome based on our input variables. And so here we're still in our development data set where we're still using that blue um, triangle rectangle down here. So it's the same patient and same genes that we made a, we might have used for cross validation. So just like with anything, if you could have had a completely independent tuning data set, that would have been optimal. But sometimes we don't have that luxury, and that's where the cross validation can help. And so once we learn this final model then we can take that final model and apply, apply it to our validation sets to get a new predicted probability. So thinking about um, development versus validation is, is really trying to get at the concept of reproducibility. I never want a, um, a prediction model that only works if my samples look a certain way or were generated from a certain clinic or happened to be a substrain of the Brown Norway 
or something like that, that, that we're trying to build these machine learning models that are as general as possible in most cases. And so one way to check that generality and the ability to have a bigger scope of inference is to apply it and see how that prediction is on a completely independent data set. So moving from green, from blue to green in this graphical example. And so that falls under this. So now we've, we've tested it, we've trained it, we've made these predictions. How do we judge whether or not these predictions are good? And so again, this may be review for some people, but I wanted to make sure we're all kind of on the same page again on some of this terminology. So the outcome of these machine learning models um, is that each individual or each instance that we're looking at is assigned a probability of a particular label. And so a lot of these terms are, are easier to conceptualize or describe if we talk about that label being disease or no disease. But for instance, applying our model to an individual may result in an output that says that this particular individual has a 90% probability of having the disease. So if the labels were disease or no disease. And so if we draw some kind of threshold on that probability, so anybody over with more than a 50% probability of having the disease, we're gonna call them predicted to have disease. We can calculate what's called a confusion matrix. And so we've seen these, in, probably seen these in your intro to statistics class where we've distinguished between true positives, false negatives, false positives, and true negatives based on what that underlying truth compared to what our model is predicting. And then once we calculate the, the amount of our samples in each one of those squares of the confusion matrix, then we can calculate some of the me measures that you may be more familiar with. And again, I've put a couple of terms on each one of these because machine learning uh, literature tends to use one. Um, clinical studies tend to use the other and um, some other fields of statistical research could even use a third. So one of the terms that we use are sensitivity. It's what I learned when first learning biostatistics, but recall is the term that's typically used in machine learning. And that's just saying, if the person has the disease, what is the probability of the model detecting it? So given that, that there truly is disease or that this, this patient can truly be assigned to this group, what's our probability of being able to detect that? Um, specificity is somewhat the opposite. So if the patient does not have the disease, what's our probability of the model indicating that they don't? So the other term for specificity is fallout. And then precision is the next one. So instead of saying, given that we know the person has disease, we can say, given that the person has a positive test, what's the likelihood that they truly have the disease? And then accuracy is summarized by how many did we get right versus how many we did get that we got wrong. And so what tool we use to summarize the, the performance of these models, a lot of times really depends on the context that we're talking about and what the cost is both um, metaphorically and literally of a false positive or a false negative. And that may influence which one of these measures then become more important when thinking about developing an optimal model. So all of those summary measures were predicated on the fact that we drew some kind of threshold on that continuous probability to say someone either had the disease predicted to have the disease or not the disease. Oftentimes we don't wanna draw that threshold. Oftentimes we wanna give a general summary and say across a variety of thresholds, how does, how does my model do? And so what we see oftentimes as a way to summarize without drawing that strict criteria of this is my threshold for saying it's a positive test versus a negative test is use what we call a receiver operating curve. 
And so the concept of a receiver operating curves is that we're going to plot our sensitivity or recall versus our one minus the specificity. So in general, when we're talking about the performance of any alg algorithm, it's, con it's a constant um, balance between do we are we good at ca capturing people that do have the disease or are we good at capture, telling people that don't have the disease that they don't have the disease. And so if we used a probability threshold of zero to say somebody had the disease, then all of our patients would have the, we would, our test would say that all patients had the disease. And so our sensitivity would be a hundred percent because every single person that has the disease, we said they had the disease because we simply said everybody did. But a probability of threshold of zero is unrealistic because then we're wrong all the time for the people that don't have the disease. So that's one extreme of the threshold. The other extreme of the threshold is that one where we aren't able to detect it in anybody who actually has it, but we're good at telling people they don't have it when they don't have it. And so at all of these other thresholds, then we're calculating what the sensitivity would recall would be, and we're plotting it on a line here. And so the straight diagonal line here would mean that it's a random classifier and we are not predicting at all. Um, but as we shift this curve closer and closer to this dot of a perfect classifier, the better our model is. And so a lot of times what we do is measure the area under the curve, the ROC curve as a measure of how in general are we doing at prediction. We can also take an opposite view. So on the left is my ROC curve. On the right is what we call a precision recall curve. And so oftentimes we're going to use a precision recall curve in our machine learning over an ROC. And the main reason is, is if we look at these two formulas that are used for my X and Y axis of a precision recall curve, um, true negatives are nowhere in this formula. And so if we're, we're trying to predict a rare event and the number of true negatives is so large that it dominates all of our performance measures, then we don't get a really good distinction in our model. And so when our true, ne true negatives highly outweigh all of our other categories, then the way to get more um, detail is to use a precision recall curve. And so this, this case comes up, this came up in some of the work that we were doing when we were trying to identify polyadenylation sites and we're looking at um, 10 KB regions. Obviously the majority of the bins that we were looking at were not gonna have a polyadenylation site in it because we were scanning such a long area. And so in that case, it was really important for us to look at a precision recall curve rather than a traditional ROC curve. And so our one of the biggest concerns from a, a analytical standpoint with machine learning is this concept of overfitting. So did we just put so many predictors in the model that adding another predictor is always going to improve our performance, regardless of whether that predictor really has anything to do with the outcome at hand. And what overfitting does is it makes our model very, very specific to the data that it was trained on. And so one route that you have as a manuscript reviewer or a reader of a manuscript is to look at the performance that they report on the tuning data sets and the validation data sets or in the detection data sets versus the validation data sets. So if you're getting a super high precision in our um, detection data sets or your tuning data sets, like 95%, but when you go to validation, it drops to 75% then that's a really good signal that there's been significant overfitting in the original model. And so they actually need to, to back off a bit on the fitting and the parameters to get a better model that'll be more generalizable to other data sets. Um, 
There, there are I, some interesting questions uh, there for you or, or comments. Um, one from Joe that got it started and then sort of a follow up from me and then a follow up from Joe. Have a look at them and see if you wanna hold off until after your presentation or field them now. So this is Joe, you can hold off if you want. I'm just parking them there to okay. make good time. So as I think of them as, as we're going along. So there's no, there's no rush, whatever works for you, Laura. Well, maybe maybe we'll we'll save them to the end just so you don't have to sit here while I'm reading them, and then we can just start the discussion, and I can catch up a bit because I haven't been monitoring the chat necessarily. Oh, and now I really screwed up my screen. Okay, so but yeah, let's let's. I I think I've got just a couple more minutes here, and then the final the final comment here was about implementation, and. Sorry, I kind of screwed up my screen here. Um, so final, when I talk about implementation is now you have, they've built this model. The model's only good to us as researchers if we can actually apply that model to our own data, right? And so do they provide some kind of software implementation or web service that we can use to put our data that may would likely only have the feature information and not the label information and receive those outcomes or those label probabilities? Um, what kind of pre-processing do you have to do um, for the labels and for the features? So one of the big concerns that initially with some of the RNA expression information about using those in machine learning models is those are relative expressions for the most part. Even when we do something like a quantile normalization, we're normalizing based on the other samples that they're with. So if, if you're normalizing in a data set that has a 50-50 split of disease versus no disease, but then you're implementing it in a data set that has 5% disease and 95% no disease, then some of those normalization methods get a bit tricky. So really thinking about how the features are transformed before they're entered into the model. And can you do that transformation on your own data to make it look similar to them? Will their model become updated as new data becomes available? And were validation data sets similar to the data sets I'd like to apply my model to? Um, we're not gonna go through this too much. There was this really, oops, there we go. There is an interesting article in JAMA a couple of years ago um, about how to read articles that use machine learning. And so this was a user guide for clinicians to really think about it, but it has some really good information in there. And a lot of the, the points that I uh, brought in today came directly from this article, but they give an evaluation, almost a checklist. They have a literal checklist in the um, supplementary information of this data set for people to go through when they're reading the machine learning literature, especially when thinking about, is it actually clinically implementable or is it rational to put it, use it on your particular population? So ending there about five minutes early, just wanna include all of our acknowledgements so this has been work. A lot of the my interest in machine learning actually came about through a graduate student in his dissertation project that he recently published in Nature Communications that was linking DNA and RNA information in, to be able to identify active polyadenylation sites in certain tissues. And then as always, we're funded and a, a cheap plug for anybody looking for a postdoc. But just so you know, there's, at the end of this was also a few of the, the articles that I used throughout and that I thought were really interesting, well put together summaries of machine learning. Um, this machine learning applications in genetics and genomics is a little bit old. It's 2015, so some of its examples are a little out of date, but there are some other really good ones that are talking about how to leverage machine learning for putting together multi-omics data, right? So, so machine learning becomes a really interesting tool when you have these really dis different types of data and wanna put those together in a coherent model. 
And so let's show us the uh, previous reference from uh, Jeff Dean was one of the co-authors. Uh, thank you. I just want to get a screenshot of that. <laughs> and I'll make these available uh, through the, the slides too, and I'll put some links to our in our get in our GitHub repository that keeps all the slides and things like that. I'll add some links too. Great. Thanks very right. much, Laura. Stop. Perfect Stop. presentation. Sure. Okay, and let me. I think the first question is from Joe Nado. He asked, uh, do the methods also give second best? And you may want to 12.41 PM. Oh, this one's one that I, I'm trying to think of the context. Second best in the context of hyperparameters or in the context of... Mm -hmm. When you do a model, you're going. You said you 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 often refer to the outcome as the best outcome, the best result, the best something. And I'm trying to. I, I'm assuming that you you with other models there that it's possible to get something less than best. Because if you're referring to best, that implies that there's something less than best. And then I'm trying to get a sense of whether you can quantify that best versus second best. Like if you do a maximum likelihood, you can get the maximum likelihood estimate and then a second best estimate. And if the second best, the, the, the maximum like the best estimate is the best, but there yeah. could be something that's incrementally less. And so it is best, but it's not, re you're not real confident versus the second best is far away. And then you are confident. I'm wondering if there's a parallel here because you kept talking about best outcome, best result. Yeah. Okay. I, I get. I understand the question a bit more now. So, in the, in an analogy to maximum likelihood, what we're now using are things like the receiver operating curve. We're using um, the those those accuracy measures. The where it deviates from something like <laughs> maximum likelihood is that was one clear cut number. Here, the, the, there's lots of ways to judge accuracy. There's lots of ways to judge performance. And you could have a model that does really well on your training data set, but does terrible on your validation data set. So in an ideal world, and, and I probably misused the term best, just like any model building process, we, mm -hmm. we don't know that we've identified the best, right? We know that we've right. identified the one that's performed the best out of the ones we tested, but we don't know universally that it's the best that is possible. So right. yeah, we have to use those um, performance measures and that's where it gets in that, that gray area of well, what if our what if your ROC disagrees from your precision recall? Which one are you basing best off of? Can, can I add a little bit to that? Yes, please. So the, the, there's a, a related idea uh, which you indirectly covered earlier, which is model averaging. You know, so the idea of random forest is that you don't pick a best tree, the best fitting tree, but you average uh, over, you know many trees, some of whom are not as good as the one. And it turns out that when you average those predictions, the random forest is usually better than the best fitting tree. And right. something similar holds for other machine learning uh, models as well. If you average, like what you were saying, actually, just if you average over a lot of like the second, third, fourth, whatever, 15th, mm -hmm. you get a predictor that's often the better. Uh, better than the, in fact, a curious thing has been observed in uh, Kaggle-like competitions. So, you know, you, you, they have these uh, leaderboards who is the best and it's often found that when you average the prediction of whatever, of all the predictions that people have submitted, that is usually like within the top five of all the, the top four performers. It may not be the best, but it's usually among the top ones. Anyway. Yeah, so, yeah the, the dream challenge showed that over and over again. And uh, that's where those ensemble methods come into play too. We didn't talk a lot about them, but it, they were in that kind of that tree that we showed is that the, the ensemble measures is saying that, that, you know, sparse linear regression, if I 
combine the results from that and from my random forest, then I get a better prediction than if I would have used them either because they both have caveats. They both have um, places that they don't do well and places that they do really well. That, that issue seems pretty important in all of this because what you're, you, you talked a lot about the different approaches for, for modeling the data. But what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is how do you get from those ver various model outcomes to the predictors? Because when you gave examples of predictors, you, you talked about the, the predicted outcome for classification for a given individual. Mm -hmm. And you come up with some, you come up with a single number for that. You don't come, you don't come, you didn't express it as a range of numbers, a range of outcomes, a range of predictions. So somehow you're distilling a range of results into a single predicted outcome. Right. And the, well, so to, to be very clear that the, that the outcomes of many of these models will be a probability. Right. So it won't be that you belong to class A. So the, the probability that you belong to class A is probably about 75%. There's a 10% you belong to class B and another, what does that leave me with? 15% that you belong to class C. But, but you came up with one number, 75% right. probability that you're, that you're in group A, class A. Mm -hmm. But you said you come up with, the, the modeling gives a range of probabilities, a range of results. Your different models, your different, what, what Sonic was just talking about too. That you average across. So, how do you get from those various model outcomes to the probability is seventy five percent for this individual? But so, so you sound like a true statistician at heart. You want some inference on it. You want a confidence interval around that probability. So, is that how I'm interpreting sort, it? Sort sort of. Um, you, yeah. you you talked about a lot about the vague about the vagaries in this, but the 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 um, arbitrary choices you make ahead of time and things like the hyperparameters, mm -hmm. the way you put the models together. There's some there's some choices that are that the the the, the researcher has to make to put these together. Mm -hmm. It's not just looking at the data without in a way those are priors, those are assumptions, those are mm -hmm. conditions. Exactly. That, yeah. And so you're trying to capture. Uh, I would think you'd want to capture some of that in the outcome, as well as just the natural variation in, in the outcome. So yeah, it, it's, it's like the machine learning equivalent of a confidence interval. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. So Laura, there's a question from um, Klaus who has his hands up. Uh, Klaus, you wanna fire away? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a practical question, Laura. Um, I've been playing around a bit with these things, so, I have gene expression data from patients that have or have not an infection, for example. Um, and then you try to look for biomarkers that sort of are able to classify and predict the outcome. Um, but you have data from like 30,000 genes. So the first thing I've, I've done here is to do differential expression and then we sort of get the top number of genes that are differentially expressed. And I then feed them into these classification predictor models. But the first decision that I had to make, and I wonder if you have experience with that or any advice is how, may, how, how do you set a threshold for your input number of genes or quality of genes. I mean, you definitely can't put a thousand genes in there, uh, but I've, I've been playing around with 10 and with 50 and then developed my rock curves. But I was always wondering with how, how much data do you go, or how, how many genes do you go into these classification predictors? No, that's that's a that's a great question, and I don't have a great answer for you. I, I'm going to have my statistician answer, which says it depends. So it depends on the the kind of um, machine learning model that you're using. So for for like a sparse regression, it would make a lot of sense to look at the genes that are differentially expressed and putting those in. But something like a um, classification tree or a random forest, it may make sense to have um, 
to also include genes that weren't differentially expressed. And the reason why you may want to include them is because it may, they may, may represent a biologically relevant interaction or, or modifier of the effect of one gene, right? And so we're not, we're not detecting the interactions in a sparse regression setting because we're still adding those up in a very linear way. Mm -hmm. But in a, in, a, in a random forest, we are allowing for some of those interactions. So for instance, we might, weight might not have been a good predictor of sex when we're looking at the population as a whole, but when we're looking at people that are on the shorter side, weight does become a good predictor. And so weight might not have been differentially expressed and might not have ended up in your model. And so I, you know, I would, I would go for my instinct and not my, <laughs> my, uh, expertise, because I, I don't claim to have that, would be that, that you really want to focus on the genes that are most accurately measured, right? So, so for instance, if you're using RNA-seq data, the ones that have low expression are going to tend to add noise, right? Because the variation is so big um, there, whereas the genes that you can, you can reliably measure and quantitate in a very tangible and robust way may be the better predictors, especially when thinking about biomarkers. Um, again, if you wanna be three steps ahead of the game, thinking about um, including genes that you could test easily in clinic too. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, in, if in it's the really... end, it has to be practical, of course. I mean, yeah. or at least that's, from our two days understanding. I would never thought that we would do so many quantitative PCRs that we've done for the viral genomes. Everybody would have told us before that's impossible. It costs too much. Nobody <laughs> will ever do this. And here we are, we're doing. Uh, but from a practical standpoint, I think at the moment to, to look at, to, to, to diagnose a patient for the expression of 10,000 genes and do that with many patients, that's probably, not practical. So uh, the the ten genes or fifty genes might be something which is doable. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Great talk. Yeah. Thanks. Well, just to follow up on that, I I should let Shonak really weigh in on this. But uh, Peter Bullman at ETH is a real statistician, and he was working with Rudy Ebersol and Evan, um, and one of his very clever statistician grad students. Um, and they have a method that Peter calls stabilized regression that's in the paper that is, should be now in the chat um, that just came out uh, yesterday, actually. Um, so you might look at that. It's beyond my pay grade in terms of, of uh, statistics, but I think Shauna can probably give you the simple version of what it tries to accomplish and what it may not accomplish. When I understand it, so you may have to wait. <laughs> uh, the, right. the, a paper, the, uh, uh, um, accompanying paper also appeared in the Annals of Applied Statistics. It just appeared. So I plan to read it more carefully. Um, I wanted to, to meet with you anyway, Sean. I'm, I'm currently in Memphis. So oh, you to, are? OK, OK. Yeah, yeah, let's try let's to get do it. it. Let's do try it. To get in touch with you. All right. Yeah. I will, we'll chat, yeah. Well, and I do want to, I, I, I feel like I too, I should hedge a little. I, I meant for this to be kind of an overview of machine learning that I do not consider myself a machine learning expert. We work with really great people that tend to come from computational sciences and, and things like that, that you even have more and have more in-depth knowledge about some of these specialized models and really, I mean, I throw the term deep learning out there, but deep learning is a, is a general term. You can get a lot more specific within that. You can get into uh, auto encoders for encoding your features into the right um, format as far as what would be useful in your, your actual model. So there's, there's a lot more depth to machine learning than, than what I've presented here or can, can um, answer questions on. I do want to answer Salvatore's question about how do you recognize if my model is overfitting and does exist a method to do to estimate that? And the best, the best 
evaluation of overfitting is does your model work on a completely independent data set right and and work again is a generic term if if it were if it's accuracy is 85 percent but was 95 percent 85 percent may be good enough for you but the 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 distinction between how it's doing on its training data set versus how it's doing on um, a testing data set is really the easiest telltale sign. There's a lot of other things that can make your test data set perform differently than your training data set. But in general, if your model is overfit, there's no way you wouldn't see that in a, in a training and testing format. And so I think that's a lot of the reasons why that should be one of the number one criteria when reviewing a machine learning project is that they have an independent validation data set or a testing data set. How about just taking your original data set if it's large enough, let's say it's a thousand, and just doing nine, a bunch of, of draws of 900, basically a bootstrap or a jackknife. Does that, can that really address the overfitting issue? So, so if you're saying that, can I just leave some sample out and use that as my testing data set? The, 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 the answer is no, right? Because there may be some biases within your data set, right? Like if I did it on all sub, all, you know, I was looking at electronic medical health records in Colorado and I built my model like that and I saved out some from Colorado and tested it on that. I have a different population that you, than you do at the University of Tennessee, right? So there's nothing, so I may have fit to that data set. And that's kind of what overfitting is talking about is there's overfitting as a statistical phenomenon, right? But there's also overfitting in that you've made your model too specific for the data that you've trained on. Okay, so, so I think, let me just rephrase that in practical terms that I understand better. If you had a contaminated data set and the contamination was throughout that data set and even in subsamples that they exist. Yeah, getting a little bit of echo. But yeah, a contaminated data set or different, just different characteristics, right? If everybody in Colorado was taking vitamins or 95% of people were taking vitamins and one of the interactions that you're seeing is this taking vitamins smoking and dope. antidepressants dope. or something like that. What? <laughs> smoking dope, I said. Yes, Isn't that what you marijuana, do? marijuana oh. on board. Yes, <laughs> that's probably a better Colorado example. You are correct. <laughs> Laura, a, a relate, a, a, an issue that's related to what I brought up earlier um, is that in, in the social science literature, People have randomized data sets, and it goes back to a little bit to what Rob was just asking, but they've randomized a data set and ask how good are predictions based on random data? It's like flipping a coin. Mm -hmm. You're going to be right half the time with a flipped coin. You're not going to be right. You're not going to be wrong all the time. You're not going to be right all the time. And so a bias coin is a little bit off from that the, the probability of 50% rather mm -hmm. than zero. And so when this has been done in the, in the social science literature, they find that the, 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 often the fitted models are better than random, but often not much better. They're a little bit better. So there's a benefit. And so I wonder how often in, in this field, in the world we live in, people use a random data set as, as a reference point for yeah. how much better they're doing with their model fitting. Yeah. And one of the things that they talked about in, in some of these review articles too is in the imaging literature, simply taking their, their images and, and changing the resolution and then mm -hmm. seeing if the model can still capture it, right? So all they've done is changed or they've taken the image and, and tilted it a bit to see if it still could come up with that. So, so no, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, we have some general ideas about our expectation of performance, giving a certain percentage of people have the disease or a certain percentage are in class A, what would the, the model's expectation, but I don't know, I, I don't know the literature on if anybody's doing permutations like you talked about and then seeing 
they, they do this a lot in, in functional fMRI and MRI in general, because there was a famous paper that poked a hole in about 10 years worth of fMRI where they did fMRI on a dead salmon brain. And they showed all kinds of wonderful activation of different regions. <laughs> it's a classic. Definitely, it should be assigned to everybody. 